the offended ex-husband, the jealous, despotic boyfriend, the rejected suitor, a one-night stand partner, a teenager with a string of police involvements, or a niece with a better friend. One of these people killed a loving, caring, joyful mother of three, sending the police on the trail of possible leads to catch the murderer and attempting to seek justice for the victim and her family. The question remains, will justice be served? Nature generously endowed Dana Laskovsky with the best qualities one could find in a person. At 36, Dana was a very beautiful and lively woman, a kind and responsive friend, a talented artist, and a loving mother. Children constituted the most important part of Dana's life. Above all else in the world, she wanted to be a mother, but for some time, she and her husband Sam struggled to have children. However, when their family expanded to three, Dana and Sam's happiness knew no bounds. Yet in 2000, the couple separated, and Dana, along with the children, moved to a new home in the charming town of Puyallup, Washington. In 2001, she turned her love for children into a profession. Someday, she dreamed of opening her own daycare, but for the time being, she worked as a nanny. In addition to this, Dana actively supported her 17-year-old niece, Amanda, during times of difficulty with her parents. For Amanda and her best friend, Emily, Dana was the aunt that every teenager dreams of having. The girls often stayed overnight at Dana's, sought her advice on any matter, and in general considered her more of an older friend than an aunt. The rest of the important people in Dana's life included Mike, whom she met approximately a year after parting ways with her husband. Mike was a pleasant man residing in Canada, but made the effort to visit Dana as often as possible, especially since the drive wasn't too time-consuming. Unfortunately, not everything was smooth in their relationship. Dana's best friend, Shauna, and Mike's best friend, John, didn't speak highly of Mike. The main issue in their relationship was that Dana was a very beautiful woman who often attracted the attention of other men, something that, to put it mildly, did not sit well with Mike. And one of the men who showed interest in Dana, thereby irritating Mike, was Patrick. Patrick worked for a telecommunications company and met Dana when he connected her television after her move. The new neighbor immediately caught Patrick's eye, but she politely rejected his advances. However, he continued to send her flowers and love notes persistently. Initially, Dana probably considered these gestures harmless. When Mike saw flowers from a competitor, he became jealous and very angry. He demanded Patrick's phone number and address, promising to deal with the persistent suitor the same day. Dana did not appreciate this. Firstly, she just wanted to continue ignoring Patrick. Secondly, she didn't want her boyfriend making decisions for her. Mike and Dana argued, and they even decided to temporarily part ways. During this period in August 2001, which coincidentally preceded Dana's death, she had dinner with her friend Shauna. To their surprise, Mike's best friend John joined them. John had recently broken up with his girlfriend, and Dana and Mike were on a break in their relationship. That evening, fueled by alcohol and caught up in the moment, they became involved with each other, much to Mike's dismay. Literally the next day, Dana received a note from her admirer Patrick in which threatening undertones prevailed. It was probably only then that Dana realized she had a stalker. Patrick hinted that he had been watching her in her home. To her horror, upon inspecting her rooms, she indeed noticed that the protective screen had been removed from the window, as if someone had entered her home that way. Coincidentally, in August 2001, Dana's ex-husband Sam attempted to re-enter her life. Sam arrived unannounced to inform her that he had sold their house. For months after their separation, they had been trying to sell the house, so he bought a bottle of champagne to celebrate this development. Sam hinted at wanting to reconcile, expressing that he wasn't ready for a divorce, but they ended up having another argument, and Sam had to leave. On August 31st, 2001, the family for whom Dana worked as a nanny couldn't reach her. Dana never missed work, and certainly not without informing her employers. The family tried contacting Dana's neighbors, but they also couldn't get through to her. Concerned, they called the police and requested a welfare check to ensure everything was okay. When the police arrived at Dana's home, they knocked on the door. Getting no response, they circled the house and found the back door slightly ajar. Upon entering, they walked through the kitchen and discovered a woman lying face down on the couch. It was Dana, and she was dead. She lay in an unnatural position, with one arm above her head and the other beneath her, 
her body twisted in a strange way. Dana's neck showed signs of bruising. It was evident that she had been murdered. The officers immediately secured the crime scene and called in detectives. Examining the crime scene and finding bloodstains on the carpet, investigators concluded that Dana had struggled with someone before her death. After the murder, the assailant placed her on the couch, added a pillow, and covered her with a blanket, as if attempting to make her more comfortable. This strongly suggested that the crime was committed by someone known to Dana. On the other hand, a broken window hinted at a possible robbery gone wrong, especially considering the entire house had been ransacked in search of something. Investigators were perplexed, with half the evidence indicating a personal vendetta and the other half suggesting a robbery. After the autopsy, the forensic pathologist confirmed that Dana had been strangled. The murder was characterized by extreme brutality. Initially, she was severely struck on the head before being strangled, resulting in a broken trachea. This level of force indicated a very strong perpetrator. It seemed likely that the attack was not premeditated, as the killer had to pass through the kitchen, where knives were available, but chose not to use them, and instead opted for bare hands. When a wife is murdered, one of the first focuses of the police is on the husband. It quickly emerged that Sam had taken out a substantial life insurance policy on his wife. The police rushed to find him, but Sam had seemingly disappeared, becoming the prime suspect. As it turned out, Sam had gone on a camping trip with the children. He had no mobile reception throughout the night and was unaware of Dana's death until he returned to civilization and received a barrage of calls and messages. When detectives finally managed to speak with Sam, they noticed bruises on his knees. He explained that he was into baseball and got the bruises during a training session. Regarding his relationship with his wife, Sam mentioned they were not living together, had arguments, but were trying to compromise. When asked where he was on August 30th at the time of the murder, Sam said he was at home with the children, briefly left while they were sleeping, but only to refuel before his upcoming trip. Since Sam couldn't definitively prove where he was at the time of the crime and was not overly cooperative with the police, investigators tried to build a case suggesting he might have gone to see his wife on August 30th, perhaps to discuss child custody, had an argument, and killed Dana. However, his actions didn't fit the timeline of the crime. It seemed implausible for Sam to put the triplets to bed, drive two hours to his wife's house just to argue and kill her, then make his way back and nonchalantly take the children for a relaxing outing the next morning. This version of events didn't withstand scrutiny, but suspicions weren't entirely lifted from him either. Surveying friends and family of Dana, investigators shifted their focus to a more likely suspect, Patrick, who had been harassing the woman. Shortly before her death, Dana told friends that Patrick had become fixated on her. She realized he was truly stalking her because he knew about things he couldn't have learned through other means. It reached a point where Dana informed the family she worked for that if she were to die unexpectedly, Patrick would be to blame. Adding to this, witnesses had seen a white van, similar to Patrick's, near Dana's house in the days leading up to the crime, painting a less favorable picture for the investigator. The police obtained a warrant to collect Patrick's DNA and search his home and van. Patrick reacted harshly, being rude and uncooperative when they arrived. However, as officers began the search, Patrick reviewed the search warrant and only then realized they were investigating Dana's murder. He had initially thought they had come to arrest him for harassment. Once he grasped the gravity of the situation, his behavior immediately changed. Patrick agreed to provide fingerprints, a DNA sample, anything to assist the investigation. He also mentioned his whereabouts on the night of the murder. After work, he stayed late with friends. His alibi was fully corroborated. Detectives reluctantly had to acknowledge that Patrick had been incredibly lucky because many witnesses and circumstantial evidence had pointed to him. Deprived of a potential suspect, investigators turned their attention to Mike, Dana's boyfriend. However, before they could talk to the Canadian, they discovered interesting information about him. Dana's best friend, Shauna, reluctantly admitted that Dana was unhappy with Mike's constant control lately. Additionally, Dana had cheated on Mike with his best friend, John. Curiously, John was genuinely in love with Dana, desired a serious relationship, and believed Mike wasn't a suitable match for her. In Dana's infidelity with John, investigators saw a clear motive. Mike could have committed the crime out of revenge, aligning with the theory that the attacker was someone Dana knew. When investigators traveled to Canada and spoke with Mike in person, 
they saw a man deeply affected by the loss of his loved one. He disclosed that he was already aware of the infidelity and had forgiven Dana. On the night of the crime, he couldn't reach Dana by phone. Displeased with how their last meeting ended, he decided to drive to her. Investigators were optimistic, thinking they finally had a breakthrough in the case with a suitable motive, jealousy. However, Mike continued his narrative, revealing that he was stopped by Border Patrol. They halted him, then turned him back because his driver's license had expired. This information was confirmed by Border Control. While investigators considered the possibility that Mike might have found another way to enter the States, they were beginning to realize that this was yet another dead end. All the likely suspects in Dana's murder had alibis. Frustrated after five months of investigation, the Washington police sought assistance from an FBI profiler to help them create a profile of the perpetrator. Notably, they hadn't completely ruled out Dana's husband, Sam, as a suspect at that point. However, the profiler confidently stated that Sam wasn't the one who killed his wife. If Sam had committed the crime, it would have been planned and he would have used a weapon. Moreover, Sam could have easily devised an attack plan during the two-hour drive from his home to hers. The crime wouldn't have occurred on a day when he had custody of the children. Even if it was an unplanned attack, there would have been bruises on Dana's face because a man in a fit of rage would start with facial blows. Shocked by the news of Sam's innocence, the profiler asked if any of the people they interviewed displayed signs of remorse. He reminded the detectives that Dana knew her killer, and they were now searching for someone haunted by guilt. The police tried to look at the case from a different angle. It was then that they discovered something that matched this rather specific characteristic. In the book where guests could leave farewell messages at Dana's funeral, Amanda, her niece, left a rather interesting note. She apologized to her aunt for not being the best niece and wrote that she had been sober for 37 days, refraining from any prohibited substances. In principle, these words did not contain anything incriminating, especially considering that the girl had lost her beloved aunt, who had always been a friend and support to her. Nevertheless, there was something in them that made the investigators take a closer look at her. Amanda was invited to the police station for questioning. Now, with Dana, her protector, absent from her life, Amanda found herself in even worse company than before. The girl was genuinely devastated by Dana's murder and shared that her aunt had always been the person she could turn to when she had problems or when her relationship with her parents was strained. The police asked Amanda if she knew anyone who would go as far as to murder a woman who cared so much for her. They reminded her of how horrifying the last moments of her aunt's life were, possibly even showing her some images, and the girl broke down. She provided the police with the name of one of her friends, Blaine. Amanda told the police that Blaine had a violent temper and had once tried to push her onto the couch and assault her when she rejected his advances. She added that he had also been in Dana's house, and after her murder, he observed the crime scene from across the street while forensic experts worked. Furthermore, after her aunt's murder, she noticed scratches on his hands. Digging into Blaine's past, the police found that he had a history of various offenses. They were eager to talk to him, but there was a problem. Blaine had disappeared. He was living in a southern state, making extradition difficult, and he showed no willingness to cooperate voluntarily. Trying to find a way to question him, the detectives decided to start with interviewing his friends. This led them to his friend, who happened to be in jail at that time. When they explained that they wanted to question Blaine as a suspect in Dana Laskowski's murder, the friend exclaimed, Wait, Blaine didn't kill Dana. Emily killed Amanda's aunt. Emily, Amanda's close friend who frequently visited Dana's house. The friend added that there was no doubt that Emily did it. They had long nicknamed her Mutant because of her inhuman strength. Emily could defeat anyone in arm wrestling and her favorite move involved a grip that allowed her to practically choke her sparring partner. It was at this point that investigators realized they had overlooked a potential suspect who stood at only 158 centimeters tall and weighed 54 kilograms. The police brought Emily to the station. She was clearly not inclined to cooperate. She behaved overly confidently, was rude to the police, and when they listed all the witnesses pointing to her, she became furious and declared that she had nothing to do with the crime. She couldn't provide an alibi either. The police obtained a search warrant for her residence, where they found a blouse stolen from Dana. Apparently, Blaine's friends had pointed them to this detail. 
They revealed that Emily not only stole the blouse, but also appeared in it at Dana's funeral. In Emily's apartment, the police also found the girl's diary containing several intriguing entries. Firstly, Emily wrote about Amanda, stating that she could strangle that wretch, just like her aunt. Secondly, the girl had a to-do list for her life, and among the ten various points, one stood out, kill someone and not get caught. These entries provided a kind of admission and motive, but the detectives understood that this was not sufficient for a confession. Moreover, any defense attorney could easily challenge such evidence. What a 17-year-old girl wrote in her diary might not be taken seriously in court. The police needed to get Amanda's confession. They invited the girl to the station again, this time directly accusing her of leading them astray several times and threatening to charge her as an accomplice. Under pressure, she revealed everything. On the evening of August 30th, when they went to her aunt with Emily, they were under the influence of illicit substances. The teenagers wanted to ask Dana for money, but Emily behaved strangely, rudely, and sharply towards the homeowner, forcing her to ask the girls to leave. Emily refused to leave. Then Dana gently touched the girl's shoulder to escort her to the door, but Emily suddenly became furious. She struck Dana on the head. Interestingly, this detail was not reported by the media, so Amanda could only have known it if she had truly witnessed the murder. After that, Emily applied a choking technique, just as Blaine's friends described. She used a scarf to strangle Dana, showing no intention of stopping. Amanda turned away, unable to watch what was happening. She heard a crunch, then wheezing, and finally, it became very quiet. Dana was dead. The girls took the money they could find and left. Amanda admitted that she did not expect everything to end this way. She thought Emily would simply anger Dana to the point where she would forbid them from coming to her home again. Detectives now understood that the crime was both an attack on a carefully chosen victim and a robbery. On the one hand, the girls needed money. On the other, Emily envied her friend's relationship with her aunt, and out of jealousy, she decided to get rid of Dana once and for all. On March 13, 2003, Emily Lonborg was charged with first-degree murder. She had already turned 18, and they were planning to try her as an adult. However, prosecutors were not confident they could secure a conviction. Emily did not confess to anything. The testimony of Amanda played a significant role, but it couldn't be relied upon since, upon seeing her friend in the defendant's seat, Amanda might retract her statements. If charges were brought against Amanda, she could invoke the right to remain silent. Even with Amanda's testimony, prosecutors were uncertain they could convince the jury that a petite teenage girl could strangle an adult woman with her bare hands. They made what was perhaps the right decision in this case. They negotiated a deal. Emily admitted guilt to involuntary manslaughter and received less than seven years of imprisonment. Amanda was not charged. Justice, to some extent, prevailed. However, this case leaves a bitter taste because, in prison, Emily exhibited model behavior. Additionally, the time she spent in pre-trial detention was counted towards her sentence. Therefore, after just 5.5 years, she became a free person. She got married, changed her name, and became a mother. Emily Lonborg, who left three children without a loving mother, now enjoys the life she stole from her victim.